Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Mathewson, founder and CEO of Wide Orbit. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We have uh, three esteemed panelists, uh, Mike McKay from A&E, uh, Jenny Nelson from Entercom, and Stephen Farber from uh, Weigel Broadcasting. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, leading media companies are finding solutions, um, how we're trying to manage through this uh, unique episode of of COVID and um, obviously people have both a lot of shared experiences is how they're managing through it. And at the same time, of course, there's a lot of um, uh, unique challenges and different organizations are, are applying different techniques to, uh, to make lemonade out of lemons. First off, maybe we'll just um, uh, talk about, you know, very generically, um, some of the challenges that your individual companies are facing and, and adapting to in the, this remote workforce. Um, Jenny, why don't we start with you? Um, at Entercom, obviously, you're, um, you went through a very large merger with CBS, and um, it's a really extraordinary uh, opportunity and company you have uh, going forward. Um, but a lot of a lot of unique challenges to radio and, and running um, a very large group. Um, how has Entercom been managed to do this? You know, it's it's um. It's interesting that when when all of this started happening in early March, I, I think we spent the first few weeks really figuring out the best way to educate our teams, get them up to speed, understand how they how to do business. And so, you know, it, it as it, we were not a virtual organization, we were we were an organization that largely worked in offices um, as a sales organization. We did most of our meetings face to face. And so this was a huge cultural shift. And I, I think that right out of the gates, what we did immediately was over communicate. We started getting out information to our teams, doing large virtual meetings. We started um, with our sales organization. We started uh, Monday and Friday webinars with the entire sales organization um, and, and really spent the first couple of weeks training our teams on how to get up to speed, how to do virtual meetings, how to set up your your apps on your phone, ensure that you're doing everything so that you know how to do business. And then from there, it gave us the opportunity to really um, create better mechanisms to communicate across the organization. So it, it, huge cultural shift, um, but I think because of the over communication, it helped us really be successful. And you know, those webinars now, you know, four months in, it's really interesting because our sales organization it, it loves them. They're like, I can't wait for the Monday and Friday webinars because it's their chance to check in, to get connected, to find out what the priorities of the company are. And it's been a great way for us to to ensure that everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Um, and, and Intercom is, uh, as we discussed before, Intercom has always been kind of a distributed organization from the standpoint of senior leadership. Um, do you think that helped you in uh, kind of managing through the, the well, the, the management process of this? I, you know, I think it made us nimble from the beginning in that we knew that we had, you know, some people in New York, some people in Philadelphia. We, we obviously have, uh, you know, our markets across the country. Um, I'm based out of San Francisco. So when we started these virtual communications and, and our, our weekly webinars and our town halls and um, you know, it was really about ensuring that everyone understood what we're doing, felt a part of things, and uh, and and that they had a chance to hear from our executive leadership, from David and from Susan, and and um, I, I think that it really, I mean, it's it's interesting to say this, but I think that as an organization, we're far more collaborative and connected than we were pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Good. And Stephen, um, Weigel's obviously um, based in Chicago, and you've had a, a long history of a um, series of properties in kind of the Midwest between um, Milwaukee and South Bend and Chicago proper, and then you um, opened up a bunch of um, uh, networks that are carried uh, by television stations largely. Um, how is it, I mean, Weigel, I assume, was managed centrally, historically. Um, how is that, how is this process? Um, been affected by yeah. affected you all. It, it was a major shift. We were not a work from home culture in any way, shape, or form. You know, into the second week of March, and then suddenly, um, you know, the vast majority of our workforce uh, was sent home, remains at home, and we've had to adapt everything from uh, technology, hardware for employees, software, uh, new workflow, 
different ways of communicating. It's been a, it's been a massive shift in a short amount of time, and uh, one that I think far exceeded our, our initial planning in terms of what we thought we would need to do, and one that has exceeded our expectations, I think, just in terms of how successful we could be. Um, groups really rose to the occasion in ways that maybe we wouldn't have thought of, found solutions on their own, and that's been maybe the most encouraging part of this is uh, there are a lot of people who have uh, raised their hand and figured out a way to fix a problem uh, before it before it became something larger and, and with a solution that was maybe much more unique than you would have expected before all this happened. Sounds good. Excellent. And uh, Mike, obviously at, at A&E, your New York-based operation, and um, yep. you have a, a great set of uh, content that you've been promoting for a long time. You've obviously had content changes that you announced in the live PD uh, went away in yep. kind of response to all of the um, uh, BLM and BIPOC, um, George Floyd um, uh, protests, and obviously you're responsive to that. So how is, so you had a, a couple of double sets of challenges. Um, yeah. uh, how's, how's that gone? Well, we're working through it day by day and we're working with all of our agency partners um you know as far as far as content yes we have had some content changes we have to be sensitive to the current environment and and talk to community leaders i know our ceo paul bucheri is very very concerned with being in touch with the community and and working with he is he set a culture and one of the key one of the key components of our culture is we want to be a kind company we want to be kind to each other, all of all of our, our individual employees, but also to the community that we're trying to serve. Outside of, of, of the live PD uh, uh, being canceled recently, um, we have actually had very good stability in most of our programming. And, and I think we're, we're uniquely positioned to weather this storm. We're not as reliant on big time scripted dramas that take a long time to produce and you have to be on set for months and months at a time when we're, we're in reality space we're very innovative in that way and very creative we do have a live a lot of other live programs. we have live rescue america's top dog for AD. we have you know pawn stars american pickers a lot there's a lot there's a lot of stability in our environment uh, married at first sight on lifetime things of that nature they're really going to carry us through and i think you know as opposed to maybe some of the bigger broadcast networks, which are so reliant on scripted dramas and, and, and the big production that, 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 that entails with that, they're, I don't know how they're gonna get back up and running in the fall when normally they'd be launching huge new seasons. A lot of that content is just not gonna be ready. And things, I've only heard things like a lot of streamers too, series that, that a lot of people are, are, are looking forward to coming back have already been pushed into 2022. So I've heard I've heard my own my own kids talk about that and say, oh, I, want, I was really looking forward to this coming back, but now it's going to be going to be another year and a half. So I think from that perspective, we're weathering the storm very well. Yeah. Now there's I'm I'm sitting in our San Francisco headquarters. There's about five of us here um, that show up with some frequency. Um, there's 180 desks here, so we uh, we can swim in the place. We we have actually my my uh, kids have come in and played. Uh, pickleball in the cafe uh, <laughs> that was their covid uh, gym class um tying back to tv the, the the picture behind me is um actually from heroes if you recall that that nbc yeah. program it literally was a prop from the show itself um that i bought off the nbc website um so it's it's where we have tv art in our uh, tv and audio tv and radio uh, focused company um <laughs> so obviously there's um, people that are attending the webinar today they're really looking for ways of um, kicking the corners on their knowledge and uh, learning new ways of uh, new technologies that they can employ at their businesses to improve their operations. Um, you all have big successful companies. You've a lot of people have really focused on trying to squeeze out um, efficiencies in your operations. Um, Stephen, what sort of technologies have you employed at Weigel? Uh, what te specific technologies have you employed at Weigel? you found to be uh, maybe surprisingly successful or surprisingly useful um, uh, in, in um, you know, continue to, to generate cash? So I think there's a, there's a wide range and that's what's been interesting through this is, you know, depending on the work group and the workflow, there's all types of some solutions from very low tech. Um, some people who clearly early on just needed a printer at home. They were more comfortable working with paper and even though they were at home, we were able to make their work much more efficient once we could ship them a printer and get a printer going because they just couldn't do everything 
on a screen. In many cases, it was getting someone a second or a third screen. Um, for our traffic teams that use your wide orbit products, they're used to you know big desktop displays. We had to replicate that in some way at home. But I think we've also found there are um, you know there are some ways we can you know remote into you know actual desktops and and, and use that. Whereas in other ways, we needed to maybe take a software product offline and give it to a user to, to use offline or use in a different way because home bandwidth is one of the greatest limitations we have in everything that we're doing at home. In some cases, we've really tried to address with an employee, how can we improve your connection at home? Sometimes it's hard. You live in an apartment building or somewhere else where you don't have control over the vendor or the, or the technology. So it, it's been everything from the lowest tech to extensive cloud-based solutions. Obviously, this is a wide orbit event. Those products have worked really well for us, are very resilient and are, are very portable and transfer well to the home environment. Um, and others, we've had to um, look for more consumer-based solutions um, for something maybe that was you know, easier to share on an app or on, or on the web than maybe something that we had previously invested in. Mm -hmm. And have you also had, uh, what's our technology is Entercom employed, Jenny, that, um, that you found useful? You know, it, it's it's been interesting um, in that we had so many tools and we have so many resources and one of the, and we were probably scratching the surface of usage on all of them. And I, I think that what this new world has enabled us to do is better utilize the tools that we have. So. I think of Salesforce as an example that we use almost primarily as a as a CRM, but there are so many more capabilities that we weren't utilizing that we've been able to to deploy, like Salesforce libraries and sharing information with our teams. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, for us right now, it's about over communication. We want to hit our teams with the same message multiple times, so that you know, so that even when they're working from home, they feel connected. They feel like they know what the priorities are. They know what we're working on. And, um, and so we've sort of created these channels, whether it be the virtual meetings or weekly emails that we now send out, um, weekly leadership briefings that we're, that we're sending out you know, from a, a email perspective. But we've also created internal Facebook groups where we can share information. And then being able to utilize the tools like Salesforce that we have and starting to use the libraries to share information and starting to use um, uh, Salesforce forms and just doing a better job of really using the tools that we already had that we weren't fully deploying. And uh, I, I think that, that that's been able to help us uh, share information more effectively and get pe get info into people's hands. Because, you know, as Stephen said, it's um, it, everyone has their own tech setup at home. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a, a hours on the phone with our internet service provider one day because it kept going down. Everyone's sort of dealing with their own tech challenges. So being able to communicate through multiple channels about the same content, I think is is helping us to um, to align and to be more effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Um, and um, Mike and Steven, are you, are you also on Salesforce too? Salesforce is Kind of like clay. I mean, you can manipulate it a lot of different ways. It's a CRM system. You get a lot out of it. Wider bit, for the record, was on uh, Salesforce. We switched to Microsoft Dynamics. Um, we are we are also on Microsoft Dynamics. We're we're not on Salesforce. Um, and I, you know, our, I, I think it's, what's been good for us is that, and we were primarily overwhelmingly at work in the office organization you know once in a while if you had some sort of outstanding circumstance somebody might work from home a little bit or but you know those those were the exceptions to the rule our IT partners have been working over the last you know they're always trying to innovate and, and move things forward they have implemented things that I think a lot of us didn't even realize that we had and what they had done earlier this year they had already implemented Microsoft Teams <coughs> That was a godsend because let me tell you, we left the office, the, the sales department left the office on Thursday, the t March 12th. None of us have been back yet. We're not going back anytime soon, probably not till 2021. But we hit the ground running immediately. I would say by Monday, March 16th, we were at 100% capacity. We were having our core a uh, core group of our, our sales executive team was meeting every single morning, first thing in the morning, 9 a.m., laying things out, then communicating to all the team leaders around both in New York and around the country. We have offices in Chicago, Detroit, LA. And it was it was 
unbelievable how seamless and how quick it was to get up and running and how easy we were able to communicate. And, and to a large degree, I think what it's really done is it's brought us all back even that much closer together. You look forward to seeing your teammates now. You look forward to seeing them and, and, and just having that little, you know, keep our, keep our, our you know, free to call up, so to speak. And, you know, everybody's really, I think, grasped it. But also, you know, you can see people where they live, kind of see their kids walking through. And it's, it's one of those things that I think is really, really helpful to pull the, the organization together and really bring our collaboration to a new level, new height that it's ever been before. Mike, I just add to that. It's like you get a snapshot into people's lives and yeah. dogs are jumping on people's laps. Yep. It just, it, it, in, in some ways, it makes, it, it, it really does connect us more because we'll do these webinars with, you know, seven or 800 people on it for our, our sales team. Um, and then a dog jumps up on, on somebody's lap and it's, yep. you, you feel like you really uh, understand people a little bit more. And I think it just makes us more connected. Yeah, it, it also changes some of the way I think that you, you deal with clients. And we've seen this with our own sales teams, because absolutely. now you can sit with a client at their kitchen table and they may not have even taken your call before. Now they're happy to literally invite you into their home. It has certainly changed the way that we are out selling advertising as well. Oh, no doubt about that. Our, up, our upfront presentation turned into a virtual upfront and we've learned from that. We've already we've already like pivoted on a dime because we just sent out an email blast to say, here's our virtual upfront presentation, please watch it. You get just so much acceptance for that. Well, we immediately pivoted to say, okay, everybody set up appointments with individual groups within the agencies. Then you had the entire group was available, they're willing to listen, they're so much more engaged. And we've had, I think, more turnout and better engagement with this philosophy than we've actually had with the Glitzy, really expensive upfront gala that you know is usually a presentation, and I think this is just so much more personal to people. And they, I think they really are accepting of it and, and, and welcoming it. Yeah. And Jenny, uh, Mike said he was he was doing, using Microsoft Teams for uh, video communication. Well, what is Intercom using? So we use. Um, we're actually we have some people in the organization testing Teams. By the way, I love it. I think it's so easy to use. We use Slack. Yeah use a, a go-to meeting. Okay, and Stephen, what at Weigel? We are largely uh, using Zoom for video. We have some Slack users. We're looking at Teams now in some different ways. And you know, the, the longer this goes on, different groups are, are going in different directions. I think that's another example of where we found even in a, you know, a, a somewhat smaller company like ours, there still isn't one size fits all in terms of how teams communicate. And depending on the group and their needs, are they a 24 hour, Seven day a week group, or are they an office hours group? Depending on how they do their work, they're they're all finding their own their own solutions at this point. Yeah, we have we have some of the same challenges as well. Uh, we've historically been uh, using Ring Central for video, and we're uh, using more Teams, and we're probably going to cut out Ring Central at some point because uh, uh, openly it's just not working so well right now. Post a recent uh, upgrade, their mm -hmm. upgrade uh, uh, effectively is failing. Um, cash flow really really important obviously advertising has dropped back very dramatically for a period of time and has come back very significantly um uh tv has some different challenges than than uh than radio does um but steve maybe you could talk a little bit about um kind of what you're seeing in the marketplace uh from a standpoint of um advertising demand and um and what you're doing to help add value to your customers um that in a in a mutually beneficial way. Well, certainly May was better than uh, April. June was better than uh, May, and in the third quarter looks uh, promising and encouraging. It's you know not going to be the 2020 any of us thought it would be, but I, I don't think it's um you know looking as as grim as maybe it felt it could be when we first got into this. Um, I think like anything else in business, it's about relationships. Our good long-standing advertisers. If there are other arrangements we've had to work out, we've worked out other arrangements. Um, we've had to listen uh, and be very nimble very quickly about other types of products, other ways to, you know, offer what we have, whether it's on a local or national level in a way that would work and, and could stay active. And, and I think we've been very responsive to that. That's where there's been been a lot of communication. So whether it's on a local level, coming up with additional content as we have in Chicago uh, to support local restaurants, to support uh, job seekers, we're coming up with things nationally that would fit in this new upfront environment that Mike talked about. 
Um, it's really been about just trying to respond to the marketplace. And this marketplace is is changing on a on a weekly basis. And, and we've had to come up with a lot of great ideas and then move on to the next one uh, very quickly. But there's a lot of optimism about the, the second half of the year. Any any tricks on um, uh, um, collections and trying to limit your DSOs? Because obviously everyone kind of went into freeze mode for, for a couple of weeks there and they seem to be kind of waking up on paying their bills. You know, I, I think it's a I think it's the same thing as it just as it relates to relationships and, and understanding. Um, um, you know, the, these are different circumstances and, and you have to approach some of it differently. And, um, you know, I, I think we feel good about where we are right now heading into the to the second half of the year. Similar experience for you, Mike? Similar, but maybe a little bit different. I mean, I, I definitely agree with most of what Steven said there, pretty much all of it. Um, mm -hmm. But there are, there are those that, you know, we have to I'll say, go back to what something Jenny said before. You got to over communicate. So we're over communicating with our finance and our collections teams. When we hear, when we get information from our agencies, we've got to immediately tell them and keep, keep a list of who may be on the fence and which companies are not doing well. Or if we get a hint, like these guys may not be paying their bills. We've actually had recently sat through and we got outside counsel and we had a entire discussion on bankruptcy proceedings and how do we approach that and who's going to be what's chapter 11 versus 7 versus 13 how do you handle it what are our what's our recourse or not are we and it's, it's just getting an education on things that really we weren't that exposed to before that said that's the doom and gloom side of it for the most part we're pretty good we're a very conservative company our cash flow is in a pretty good place we're very well run, thank God. You know, our, our finance department does a great job with that, and our, our, our corporate parents, Disney and Hearst, uh, run a pretty tight ship. So, you know, in that respect, we're in good good standing. But like you said, the credit and collections, those guys are on their toes. They're, they're constantly looking at what's going on out there. Do we need to put somebody on a watch list? Does it need to be cash in advance? How 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 much is how much is the uh, accounts receivable aging out? And yes, it definitely has grown a bit, but. Then we work with the agencies and the clients directly and say, what are the terms you're looking for? What assurances can you make and so on and so forth? And we've been, for the most part, everybody's being pretty reasonable and just trying to get through it together as partners. And I think that will just make our relationship stronger for the future. Yeah. And Jenny, this has got to be a situation where there really is no real differences between TV and radio. Um, yeah. so the same economic challenges, the same set of or similar set of advertisers. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what have you seen or what's it, been helpful? You know I would say very similar to what Stephen and Mike have said. It's it's at this point, I think it's about partnership, really understanding our clients' individual situations, being proactive, over communicating with them. Our finance team has been outstanding in helping us understand our agings and helping our our individual sellers understand that. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think that you know. From our perspective, it's about really, we want to be partners to our clients and, and understand what they need, both from a marketing solution standpoint and from a business strategy standpoint. And so, uh, you know, our goal is to work with them effectively um, so that, you know, it, it helps our cash flow and it, it ultimately helps their business. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And Jenny, kind of back to you, the, I mean, obviously the um, commute hours of bring shrunk considerably and that's a big part of what what it's uh, driving the radio bus um how is streaming and digital um, stepped up because i just got to believe there's a lot more people listening to radio at home um, oh, they, yeah. they want their radio fixed they want conversation um that and they want to hear from djs that typically would hear in the car and now they're not in the car so uh what sort of behavior are you seeing you know it, what we're seeing is that is that this has really, um, in some ways, grown audio in general because people are spending um, more time with audio. They're doing it across different devices. So, to your point, more time with podcasts, more time streaming. They're, they're, you know, while I'm not in my car, I'm listening to my favorite personalities in the morning on my Alexa device. So, I think that that this is really changing the way consumers behave. It's changing consumer behavior in general, so that I still listen to my morning show every morning as I'm, you know, getting dressed, making breakfast, getting the kids ready. Um, but I'm not necessarily doing it on my commute. I'm listening to it in my home across devices and and, and on my computer and on my phone as well. And so I think that that this has just expanded the audio universe and people are consuming more content than they ever have before. And Eric, to your point about um, 
about spoken word and personalities and local content, I, I think that that's where we're really seeing um, where we're seeing traction and we're seeing the connection with our audiences. Um, people connect with their personalities, with the morning show that they listen to, with the 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 talent that the you know the personalities or the influencers that they listen to on their drive home, and they're they're just consuming that now in different ways. But there's even um, you know, I think that that local connection of the personalities is stronger than ever, and people are tuning in to get their news or their, um, you know, what's going to happen with baseball sports talk or their, um, or you know, just what's happening in in my local community from their personalities. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt media consumption has come up really significantly. Um, at, at the same time, there's just a lot of changes, so. Um, you have to put yourselves in the advertiser's shoes trying to figure out, okay, here was my budget and here was my schedule. Everyone kind of went into semi-freeze mode for a while and trying to figure out, oh, do I just cancel right away and rethink or do I rethink and move on the fly? What do I do? Um, how do I react to different consumption changes? Um, Stephen, what have you seen uh, from a standpoint of um, how advertisers have, have changed their behavior and um, in, in putting money to work, um, chasing after those growing audiences? Well, there's been a mix, right? There was a rush to cancel, certainly by some advertisers right away. And, you know, you work through that. And then I think you see that, you know, there are some who take the right long view, understand the value of being on even in a, in a difficult time. Uh, the messaging changed a lot. A lot of the messaging early on was about, uh, you know, America being in this together and, and recognizing a lot of the, the heroes who were helping us as a nation through this. And, and then you start to see some more product focused messaging uh, as as you've gone through and, and those who have been on and and been able to stick with it or have had the resources to do it um, benefit. They benefit um, from better deals. They benefit from great exposure to people while they're at home. But I think it's also a reminder, um, you know, that, that marketplace, very fluid. And and the 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 great brands, the the great advertisers find ways to quickly adapt, uh, get new creative on air. I think you know viewer expectations of what creative looks like are quite different right now. And and um, you know a lot of it has really been uh, successful because a lot of people have been at home and are maybe more active consumers than they than they once were if they're in a position to to spend. S similar uh, similar perspective, Mike. Yeah, a lot, all, we've experienced all of that and, and seen some, I mean, you can really, it, it's, it's really fun to see how different companies operate through troubled waters, right? The navigation styles vary as much as CMOs vary, I guess. And, but certain companies are always frenetic. They're always chaotic, even in normal times. In these times, it's out the window. I mean, we've had, we've had, we've had advertisers come to us threatening us with lawsuits to get off the air when they have no recourse. So we, it's up to us whether or not we want to provide relief or not. And we try to work with them and we do work with them. We let them out as, you know, of, of a reasonable amount. You know, we have a business to run as well as they do. Within a month, they're back begging to get back on the air. <laughs> it's like, some people want to shift back. Now the back end of the quarter gets all tight and we got people who want to shift up from, they, first they want to move out of the quarter, then they wanted to move back into the second quarter. So it was, we saw everything, the entire gamut from, People threatening just not to pay bills. People threatening not to send a creative. People that are like, okay, you have to do that. The agencies try to talk their clients off the ledge. They're stuck in the middle too, saying, I don't know, I don't want to deal with this any more than you do. But it's it's just literally getting through that first month. I would say was about trying to calm the panic and trying to work with people and let them know, look, we're not saying yes or no right now. We'll do what we can do for the next like maybe two weeks. Then maybe we'll take another two week look and see how things are going. Don't worry if we don't say we're not gonna, we're not gonna let you out of the entire quarter at once, we're gonna do the right thing. I think as we started to go along, people started to appreciate that, that we were just calm and just trying to tread water, get through, take a longer look at things, look at what the, the landscape was. And then you saw people start to say, okay, but maybe I don't need to cancel everything. Maybe I actually wanna spend more money or maybe I wanna move money up to take advantage. There's a lot of, there were studies done, a lot of studies done, especially after the, uh, the 0809 financial downturn. When you looked at, and then after 9-11 as well and some other uh, recessions in the past where those advertisers that stayed on the air 
and actually maybe even accelerated if they had the means to do so, came out of those recessions so much stronger than those that said, let's just chop, chop everything and put it to the bottom line. In a short term, to get their share back afterwards was so prohibitively expensive in most cases. And we just tried to like just provide some of these studies to people and say, just let's learn from the past, guys. Let's take it one day at a time, one week, one, two weeks at a time, and we'll move forward and we'll move forward together and try to help each other out. Well, and we've also seen a lot of studies that I'm sure you both, you all have seen as well about brand loyalty and that brand loyalty in many ways is, is out the window right now. And so there's a huge opportunity for brands and companies to position themselves and, and take market share. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, a, and for me, it's all about messaging. I think that those companies that came out with authentic messaging, you know, not the overproduced, but you know, with and that have been nimble in being able to adjust their message throughout this are, are the ones that are really seeing the impact. Yeah, and certainly some of those have been uh, direct to consumer and DR. Um, Stephen, you have a, a significant DR business. How do you think that's? Um, is, has there been a lot of DR players that have really taken advantage of this? I mean, the audiences are up. Um, some of the DR players and direct to consumer players have done phenomenally well in in uh, COVID. So. Yeah, I think you know it's it's yet another example of why why that is such an interesting marketplace, right? The the ability of a DR advertiser to quickly reprice their product, to change the product mix, to get on the air quickly with an efficient message. Um, I'm I'm sure there are case studies to be done on uh, DR over the last several months. You know, immediately seeing you know whether it's seeing hand sanitizer and masks advertised, to just other offers that quickly get on the air, the ability to change creative quickly. And um, again, with, with audiences up for the most part across the board, I think there's been you know great response and probably some new direct response shoppers or people who you know had not looked at it in a long time who are back buying products because they're comfortable uh, going online and doing that or picking up the phone and doing that and having it sent to their, to their front door. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So switching gears here a little bit, um, there was just some early questions that came in. Um, onboarding new employees remotely is challenging. Um, you've some hired, some of your recruiting team is hiring people that they've never met in person, they've never been to a corporate office, uh, but at the same time, there's obviously work to be done. You wanna be productive and growing as organizations um, and openly re replace positions that have uh, moved on, people that have moved on or uh, just growth is necessary. Um, any suggestions or things that have worked well in, in onboarding new people and and in hiring new people? Well, I'll take I'll take some of that because I've got I've got three new people on my team that I've never met in person, and uh, in varying different different parts of my organization. And and quite honestly, what we've done is we've communicated amongst I have like four direct reports. They run distinct areas. And we're communicating amongst each other on what works for onboarding and we're developing protocols for onboarding a new employee and you know obviously some of it's specific to what they do but in general how do you pull them in how do you like teach them how much should you communicate with them how do you make them feel part of the group you know a lot of a lot of different teams around our com company and and overall our entire sales department what's where we have entire departmental meetings where it's just it's more like okay end of the day let's do some business Let's get some 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 you know administrative items taken care of and, and make sure everybody knows what's going on. But at the same time, then let's turn it into something a little more fun, more of a team building. We had a, a few weeks about a month ago or so. We actually had um, we had Amy's top dog competition. So we all a lot of, a lot of the people submitted their dogs, submitted video, submitted pictures and a video, and then they they played it through and everybody voted. We had judges judging on the side. And then they announced the winner. We've had. Uh, DJ competitions and stuff like that. So that just makes people like, oh, wait, you know what? I may not have met these people in person. I may not have been able to hang out with them, but oh, this is kind of fun. They seem like, you know, they're kind of somebody I really want to eventually meet and hang out with. I think that just gives them part of a feeling of being, you know, a member of a team and part of something bigger than themselves. So I think that's really important of giving them something to look forward to and wanting to get on these teams meetings and, you know, and just learn from people our biggest concern obviously is mentoring the next generation and making sure that none of that is lost so that's that's a big concern within our organization mm -hmm. um similar experience jenny 
Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. We have uh, a large group of AEs across the, the, the company that, um, that have started since January, many of whom have never been in an intercom office. And um, we identified pretty early on in, in all this that we really needed to connect this group. We've also got a new group of sales managers. So we've started, um, we've started these like classes where once a week we'll get together with this new group of, of sellers or a new group of managers, and we'll talk through what are the challenges that they're having? What are, what are, they, uh, what are they frustrated about? What's working, what's not? And we have them really drive the conversations but um, for, for our new AE group, we've got about 45 people in that group that just, it, it gives them people to reach out to and connect with, but at the same time, lets us talk with them, help train around different subjects. And we spend about an hour a week together. 30 minutes of that, I would say, is focused on some sort of training curriculum, very informal. And then 30 minutes is asking questions, talking about things that, that, that they want to know. And they dictate the agenda. They tell us what they want to hear about and what they want to talk about. And the other thing that's been really interesting, and this goes to one of your earlier questions, Eric, is about platforms, is uh, about a year ago, we launched a training platform called BrainShark. And um, BrainShark is like training curriculum that you can access through Salesforce, their modules. And, and we built out a whole onboarding curriculum, a um, advanced training, a solution-based selling for our sales organization. And we saw very uneven execution. And we started these um, Monday calls. And on the Monday calls, we started showing, here's the markets and what percent of the markets have completed this. And week one, and I'm gonna make up these numbers, but directionally, this is you know, about 40% of the markets had completed it. Five weeks in, we had 100% participation. And we had people sitting on these calls from our sales manager to our executive team saying, I did that brain shark and it's made me better. And it totally changed the way that our team thought about brain shark. Brain shark pre COVID was a, oh, I have to do it. Whereas with a captive audience and people sharing how it worked for them, it became a, oh, I get to do this. And it's just, it's, uh, it's changed the way that we, that we train and, and onboard. And I think that, um, it, we did, you know, we have, we have markets across the country and our, our, our markets really manage their onboarding. And by making this, you know, uh, uh, by creating onboarding that is cross company, I think it's just, uh, it's making us better. Sounds good. And we will uh, ask some questions from the audience. Uh, Michael Schultz has asked, um, you know, basically saying that um, new remote work structure is working pretty well for most companies. Um, in light of this, um, has your company considered the option of allowing your employees to continue working from home post COVID? Um, Stephen, um, what's uh, what's Weigel um, opted to do, or at least what's your current crystal ball polishing allow you to do? Yeah, the, the crystal ball polishing is, you know, we're going to have a lot of people working at home for a long time. Um, I don't know how to how to measure that in terms of duration, but again, you know, we we, we had very few people who were ever routinely working out of the office before this happened. And I think that we know long term, um, you know, we've seen some work groups that can be as or more efficient doing it, um, where people can be um, happy employees and uh, be content. And, you know, we can we can retain some people in that way. So, you know, I think our workforce will change in some way. What percentage? I don't know. Um, for right now, we've taken a long view and we've told our employees to prepare for a very long stretch at home until we're very comfortable that it's very safe and necessary to put a lot of people back in back in the office. So we're 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 really uh, hunkering down here for a for a longer stretch of work. Um, Mike, what what other kind of perspective do you have looking out in the future of where you think A and E's? I mean, nobody really knows when COVID's going to end. Whether it'll slowly die a death uh, later this summer as humidity levels go up and uh, whatever um, unique drug uh, is, is evolved to uh, help help that process, or maybe a year from now we'll be like, oh, let's do another webinar and how uh, how things have gone over the last year. Really yeah. hard, really hard to guess. But um, what's been the plans at A and E from a standpoint of you know kind of where I'm sure it's steady as she goes, but um, where do you think you're going to be go from a standpoint of of not having to commute? I believe you mentioned the other day three and a half hours a day into Manhattan. 
um, uh, I assume you're so. <laughs> not, not doing that in the, any anytime soon. Yes, definitely. And by the way, I hope you're right about the humidity because right now I've actually been working out of Savannah for a couple of weeks because my son's down here and it couldn't get much more humid. <laughs> the heat, I mean, heat index yesterday was like we're 110, I think. But um, yeah, no, we, you know what? I think that's another thing that's really great about our company and, and, and the caring for the employees. We've said, yeah, we're not coming back in. They're thinking about things like even this. How do we get people up and down elevators if they have to socially distance? You know, you can't you can't move people around the building. So there's a lot of we have a task force looking at that, and there's been a lot of talk about it. But um, you know, I think both our, our CFO and our and our, um, uh, our head of HR have both talked about um, um, working from home for the long term. And yes, I do three and a half hours plus of commuting, so that's you know a godsend to get some of that time back, both personally and professionally. I mean, we're seeing so many people that are more productive because their commute is about a minute from one room to the other instead of instead of two hours. So, um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna continue to look at it, see how well it's working, um, and see how often you need to come into the office. Like I said before, one of the things we're concerned about is the next generation. How do we pass it on? How do we keep the company strong and mentor the next the next generation and bring them up? We're we're constantly doing that in our departmental meetings now about letting some of the the, the younger staff kind of run a meeting. So what are you what's on your mind? Why don't you guys report on things from your perspective so that we can hear from you guys? But you know, as far as the long term, I can tell you I never plan on working in the office five days a week again. It's just there's no re there's no reason for it. Um, most of our staff has said exactly the same thing, except for maybe some of the ones with, you know, like four to four to eight year olds running around. They're like, one of them said, I'll work in the office six days a week if you let me. <laughs> so yeah. we do have to be cognizant that everybody's in a little bit different situation. So some people it's very difficult. It can be very distracting. Other people are loving it and finding it much, much, much more productive. So we're gonna just work with everybody, see what works for their situation, see how they can be the, the best employee and the most productive. And you know, I think we'll just continue to evolve it over the next couple of years. But no, I do not see us ever being the same, everybody's in the office working five days a week organization in the future. I don't see it. I'm just, for, for most of our positions, it's not necessary. There are some obviously production and and that that's obviously you know you got to be there it's hands on but aside from that it's to a large degree much much better and more productive this way sounds good well we're we're, we're basically out of time um i wanted to at least give stephen and, and jenny an opportunity to just uh throw in any last comments or, or thoughts you have on things that have worked well for you that you want to um share with the audience sure just you know one last point uh, on the question before about onboarding um i think you know, we're looking very differently at how we train people going forward. And it's going to change some of our vendor relationships. And we look at a new software tool, we're going to want to be really confident that we can help an employee get up to speed. Our culture before might have been a little bit of, you know, pull up a chair, look at my screen, I'm going to train you. And and you can't do that in a, in a world where everyone's at home. So, you know, we're we're really rethinking and using some of this time to rethink every aspect of our business going forward. At the same time, I think we're very confident we can um, manage a remote workforce. We can uh, work with our advertisers and our vendors, and we can keep our employees uh, as safe as possible. So we're we're confident we can get through this. We'd all like to be in a place where we can shake hands again, but um, absent that scenario, I think you know we feel very confident about our ability to uh, to deliver on our on our business goals here for for quite a while. Sounds good. And Jenny, your thoughts? I, I, Stephen, that was just so well said. I, I, I totally agree. I think that we've, you know, I, I think that the, what I'm hearing from everybody and just talking with, with other colleagues at other companies as well is that for, for the most part, companies have done a great job adapting and, and to this new reality. And I think that for the um, foreseeable future, we have, uh, we've got to recreate the way that we do business. And I think that, you know, I know at Entercom, we've done a great job adapting that's actually made us better as a result of this. And um, to your point about looking at your vendor relationships and your partnerships, and it, it, this gives us an opportunity to rethink what's the best way to do business. How, how can we be better partners to our clients? How can we uh, better serve our listeners? How can we better serve all of our stakeholders? And, and in that, it's looking at the tools that we've invested in. It's 
taking those tools and ensuring that we're maximizing them and leveraging to their fullest extent. And, and more than anything, I think it's about that communication and connection. It's about ensuring that our, our teams feel uh, connected, that they feel that they understand, you know, what their role is and how they're, they're part of the larger vision and that we can support our, our clients and our listeners with the best content, the best advertising space and, and, uh, and deliver on that promise. Well stated. Well, thank you, uh, Stephen, Mike, uh, Jenny. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time and sharing your thoughts. Thanks, thanks everyone that's listening. Uh, please don't hesitate to uh, send me a note if you have any questions or anything I can help with. Send a note to Eric E R I C at wideorbit.com. Happy to hear from you. Uh, obviously, whatever's organization wants to continue to do better, supporting all of our clients. And, um, other than that, uh, stay happy, stay healthy, and look forward to talking to everyone soon. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye.